All right, guys, I hope you like what you see already. It's, uh, this is a Revision AI Mac. Uh, this is a release, this is a recent Craigslist find. I, I have cheesed it a little bit, so a uh, hard drive was dead on it and I've already installed Mac OS 9.2.2. Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, just 9.2, too many twos. Anyway, uh, this is uh, something I've been wanting to work on for a while. I've, I've actually you know, had the misfortune of working on these back in the day, but um, now I have one for myself, and uh, I'm going to talk you through uh, some of the things I want to do with it, and a, um, uh, excuse me, uh, we're going to take it apart, slide the motherboard out, and I'll, I'll show you how this thing goes together. It's, believe it or not, it's a bit more of a kludge uh, than one would might expect, and uh, so stand by, and uh, I'm going to start disassembling it. And here we go. All right, so we're gonna start taking this thing apart. So step one is underneath this handy dandy handle is a, is a screw. We're gonna take that out. Like so, and we're just gonna pull gently on this 22-year-old plastic, it should come out like so. And there's a few more screws we have to take out, but let me explain what you're seeing here. Uh, right now, this is a 15-pin, um, I believe it's a 15-pin, let's double check, uh, Apple-specific uh, monitor connector. Uh, back in the day, Apple used to use a proprietary 15-pin it's almost, it looks almost like a joystick connector uh, output for their monitor. You can see, there you go. And this is a serial port for the infrared port at the front of the, at the front of the iMac. That's one of the reasons I wanted a revision A. And this is going to be a connector for the USB ports and all the other uh, fun stuff that are on this, on this iMac. The screw here we have to take out, <clears throat> and this is where power is inputted into the device. It's almost like a mini, mini. Uh, it's just it's like a small uh, ITX power supply. You know, same number of pins, just miniaturized, same shape connector, just uh, just right here. All right, so now that we've got these doodads disconnected, there's uh, two screws at the top, right here. I don't drop any. All right. And then the whole monitor assembly should slide out like a little sled here. Just be careful with these wires. There we go. And you can see we got a big old massive fan, and the whole unit comes out in on a little sled. Um, <clears throat> and then let me recombobulate everything here, remove this from the table, and then I'll kind of point out th key features on the motherboard. All right, we're back. And surprise, surprise, the GoPro doesn't output video when you're recording the cards. <laughs> so we're gonna do this kind of blind here. So, so here it is. This is the iMac uh, Revision A uh, motherboard. And it is a... Um, I mean, if anyone's familiar with an old Power Mac or uh, G3 or one of those other older Macs, you see some very familiar things. We've got a ROM card here. We've got a, let me just casually pop this open if I can without disturbing the camera. Bear with me. This is where the CPU is housed and I did this once before, there we go. There it is. Um, this is the CPU card right here, and they, these are, there's gonna be a top RAM chip and a bottom RAM chip on this guy. Let's see if I can get this out without breaking it. This looks like it's a retainer clip of some kind, and there it is, smooth. Um, <clears throat> this machine has been at least opened at least one time in its life. I found a strip screw when I was uh, taking it apart the first time to replace the hard drive. And you can see there's the 
very crude heat sink right there, no thermal paste. And there's the G3 processor. And let's see if we can get this poor thing out. Come on, baby. <clears throat> careful so you can see there's the original RAM slot I'm not sure what that is I know that in this thing there's an ATI rage chipset not sure what that is but I'll give you a little close-up there and then on the other side uh, this guy as well now you can see that there's two RAM RAM slots this is uh, I think this is 66 megahertz uh, SD RAM laptop form factor and originally this machine would have come with uh, 32 megabytes because when I boot this thing up this thing had uh, 96 and we take a look at this and you can see it's just the crap is crap RAM you, <laughs> you could buy Hyundai um, 32 megabyte RAM and we're just gonna casually toss that aside all right so now we have this this CPU card and this CPU card here, and I'm not gonna clean it, so forgive me. I'm in an area where I don't have a dust can, I don't have anything else, so we're just gonna cobble this beast together and uh, see if she'll take all um, 256 meg. Uh, this RAM is starting to get surprisingly expensive. It's a, um, well, it's not really high density, it's just, there's a lot of low density chips on this thing. This is um, PC100. I believe it's each one of these is uh, 128 megabytes. Because I know some of these will only see 256, or the RAM socket will only see one side of this um, this uh, RAM chip. And I don't know which version of this machine I have. It says some revision A's can see it, some of them can't. So I'm just going to pop these guys in and then slide this thing down. You can see that the CPU card slots in the tray, into the cage, excuse me. There's two little slots here. You can see right here there's a slot here and there's a slot here. And then it just presses down firmly into the socket. And there we go. And I'll uh, take this ramp, this ROM card out here so you can kind of see what's on it. It's nothing nothing special. Um, there's the ATI RAGE chipset. It might not be a RAGE, it might be the earlier version. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I've already taken the clock battery out. I don't plan on putting one back in there in case it leaks, you know, 10 years down the road if the caps don't first. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and there, there it is. There's a few other uh, chipsets in there that uh, I don't know. I don't know exactly what's going on here. I know there's a 56k modem, so one of those is going to control it. Um, I mean, but if, like I said, if you're familiar with a uh, Power Mac G3, a lot of these things look very familiar. Um, <clears throat> and you can see, I'm going to slide this up a little bit. You could see that you have two uh, IDE connectors. You have this mini miniature one for the CD drive. And then you have this one here for the IDE drive. Um, looks like you have a power connector for the um, IDE. I'm not 100% sure what this does. I believe it's just ports um, from the side on this guy. And same thing for this. It's just ports somewhere on the device. Now to get at the hard drive in this thing, and I'll actually bring out the original one. All right, so. Originally, this this one came with a Quantum Fireball, and it's a second edition, 3.5 inch, slow POS, and I believe it is four gigabytes. This one came with a four gigabyte drive, and it it makes a horrific noise, and I'm not going to plug it in. It's just dead. Don't don't even worry about it. So to change this. Um, if we slide this back a little bit, you notice that on this drive that there's two Phillips screw, screws right here, so these need to come out. And then you'll 
notice that if you push back on this, it seems to be spring-loaded, it'll come up. And you can actually delicately lay that. And you could see the, the hard drive. Those screws I took out are actually for the hard drive tray. You don't need to do that for the, um, the CD drive. I apologize, that's bad information. Don't use it. Um, <clears throat> but you notice that there's this spring clip here. And what that does is that retains the CD drive in its position uh, all the time. The idea being that um, it's by this tab here connecting to this guy right here, it will always be pushed against the front of the computer. Uh, I'm not sure why they did that. Um, the later later ones don't have this this deal. I think this was just a bodge um, just to get it to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just to get it to work using all off the shelf components. And then to put it back, you gotta line the tab up and then you'll know it's there and then it locks in. There's actually two retaining tabs on the front that lock in right here and right here on this side. And what they do is they basically prevent it from going in forward and back. Let's say if you're trying to eject the tray, you can see it's kind of loose, but it doesn't want to, it always kind of returns back to its original position. Um, if you're looking at the original uh, mechanism here, there would have been two retaining clips and it would have sat inside its plastic housing uh, on the computer and it wouldn't be jostled around. It would, you know, there would only be, um, you know, one millimeter of movement up and down, left and right, so it wouldn't jostle too much. All right, so that's, that's that. And what I'm gonna do, since this really doesn't do anything even out of the box, I'm just gonna stick that back on, half-ass. And then we're going to just casually stick that on and stick that in there. And I might have cut myself. No, I didn't. And then I'm just going to stick this cage back on just to, this is more of a, you know, just get it together proof of concept. At some point I will be doing a um, thorough cleaning of this machine. This is just, hey, it's out of the box. Let's see what it's, what all what all happens with it. Um, because I don't even know if that RAM's good. I suspect it is, you know, but anything you buy off eBay nowadays is could be counterfeit or you know, trash. Um, so yeah, let's get this thing back together and see, see what's going on. All right, so we're gonna slide this bad boy back together. And, you know, as that old adage from a Chilton's manual is, installation is the reverse of removal. That's pretty much the truth here. But I mean, this thing is just an absolute kludge to get back together. Getting it out is one thing, but getting it back in is just an exercise in patience because, oh, that one went in quite nicely. Well, there you go. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you're just totally wrong. It just works. Um, I was channeling, channeling Todd Howard there, ladies and gentlemen. It just works. Yeah, put the two screws back in. Now every screw, the pairs of screws are the same, but every single screw is a different thread. It's a different size. It's just, I mean, they literally parts bin this thing together. It's it's quite terrible. So we're gonna put the power connector back in like so. I'm gonna slide in the front connectors, speaker, that sort of stuff like so. And get this thing back in. Now, something uh, you may have noticed when we were taking this machine apart is that it has no airport slot. Um, when this machine was devised, uh, USB had not yet been finalized. So this is not even USB 1.1. I believe it's USB 1.0, and it's you know it's a little weird, but it you know it works. And like I said, no Wi-Fi. It's got a 10-100 uh, LAN port on the side. Let me finish putting this before I start talking a little bit. Bear with me. You'll notice that on this cable, it's not centered. It's a uh, offset. You know, they angled it specifically so that it would be angled, and there would be a slight twist to the cable as it went into the case. It's kind of an odd, odd thing to do. Thank you. 
Is it has to slide down first to line these pins up before it goes in. I you know the sled was was is normally bad, but I think this is going to be the be worse than the sled when it decides to not cooperate. Yeah, this sound was plastic breaking. There we go. Actually didn't break a tab. I don't even know what that is. All right, get in. Bing, bada boom, and there you go. It's back together. Now, let's while we're here, let's take a look at the, some of the side ports. So, on the on this machine, you can see that it's got, you know, modem of course. Um, on the later. On the later IMAX, especially the ones with Firewire, there's normally a reset button and a programmer switch you can push about right here in this area. And there are things that you can use, um, you know, your finger and you could just press it. But you notice that they actually have their paperclip sized hole. So let's say you ran out of memory um, and this thing came with Mac OS 8.6 or 8.5 when it came out and you ran out of memory in the 36 meg, it just hard crashed, you would literally have to find a paper clip to push that reset button or unplug it, you know, in, my, <laughs> in most cases. Now that that memory's come back, yes, yeah, so we, we would just unplug it and then power it back on. That was the other way to reset. So the, I, I don't understand the point of these two uh, buttons then. Um, 10 100, of course, um, USB, and then mic in, and then audio out. And then of course there's two stereo speakers in the front and uh, and an infrared port and that brings me to some things that I want to do with this machine is that in on the legacy Apple machines they used to have a serial port kind of look like this it's a mini DIN connector and because the iMac came out they started making things like this this is a key span USB to serial adapter specifically for Mac and it took advantage of using the USB ports like this. And that's what I'm going to use to interface with some of the older uh, Apple equipment I got lying around the house. In addition to that, I have, where is it? Do is, I have this marvelous device and I'm not, I think it's made by Vonnets. Um, but what it does is basically a um, Ethernet to wireless bridge. I think it supports 2.4 and 5 gigahertz uh, wireless. And what it does is it has an, either an external power adapter, or in this case it uses 5 volt off USB, and that just plugs into your Ethernet port. So it's, it's feasible to actually get this thing online, connect to the Internet and do stuff, or connect to local talk um, with you know, wirelessly to your vintage Apple network if you've got a uh, airport or something else that you're it's being that's functioning as your router. Um, <clears throat> on most of, most of these machines, you find uh, you it's very difficult to find these with the actual matching door. Uh, most of these, as you can see, if you wanted to plug in like let's say this dongle, they would have to all be fed through this port. And in most cases, people would have to reset the machine or they do something and they would just take this off and it would just disappear in time. I was lucky enough that mine came with that. And uh, yeah, let me set this thing down. And let's start getting ready to boot up. All right, so without further ado, let's uh, power this guy on. And you notice that the power button on the keyboard is it plugged in? Doesn't work. <laughs> there it is. Works. <laughs> <clears throat> I 
So while it's booting up, let's take a look at some of the front port options. You've got um, two uh, stereo outputs. So the idea was is that you'd have, especially in schools, you'd have two sets of headphones, you know, two people on either side, and they'd be doing something. Um, stereo speakers, of course. And this is this is the one I want. This is an infrared port. And for those of you who those of you who have watched the Palm Pilot video know I'm a little bit of a nut and a fanatic. Um, <clears throat> that would have been used for either hot sync or you could actually communicate with the computer. And it seems like in the revision Bs, the later revision Bs and the rest of the um, the first generation iMacs, especially the, the tray loaders, they remove the infrared port. So the revision A and the very early ones, they're, they're the only ones that have an infrared port. Oh, and I have a feeling that that RAM is no good. <laughs> <laughs> Strange, I don't know what that is. That's freaking weird. try resetting the PRAM. It's uh, command option PR. Needs a reset again. <laughs> Power on PR. All right, here we go. I'm going to install 10.3 on this because obviously it works. <laughs> Something's going on with either that disk or, or who knows what. So one of the things I wanted to do with this computer is that obviously this serial adapter will give you an idea. Is um, I do have a lot of vintage Palm Pilots, um, Apple Newtons, and they'll eventually stumble their way onto the channel at some point. And I wanted to basically use this machine as a way to centrally manage that data and basically interact with the devices. Because I know that there's not a lot of stuff for Windows 10 uh, with regards to dealing with Apple Newtons, but there is quite a bit for uh, classic Mac OS, you know, the obvious, the one that was originally released with the device, um, as well as uh, like, I think it's NCX, uh, Newton Connection Utilities for Mac OS 10. I know that works very well. Um, I have a PowerBook G4 here lying on the ground that I was tempted to use, but I mean, come on. It's got a CRT, you know, super sexy, you know, looking looking computer like this. I mean, that's 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 the way to go. So right now I'm partitioning the I can just extend this fine. I am partitioning the so on these on these original Macs, you have to partition the first eight gigabytes, um, and basically it has to be less than eight gigabytes in capacity in order for this to boot. Um, that's specific to the revision A, B, uh, C, and the fruity color iMacs. I think I think just the IDE well, the early IDE ones. They're limited to the hard drive maximum size is limited to 128 gigabytes and won't see anything higher than that. That was the original um, at our IDE specification. And in order for this to boot, you still need to be within the first eight gigs of um, space on that 128 gigs. I know there's a reason for it. I don't know exactly why. It is what it is, whatever. <laughs> All I just know is that if you are doing this, be sure to format, you know, first eight gigs, less than 128 gigs, uh, 128 gigs in size on the, on the drive. I reasonably, um, I was having problems. I had a, um, 
I was going to use an SSD. I had one of these, uh, actually I have several of them, uh, cheap and some not cheap uh, IDE to SATA. And I was just going to use, you know, an old SATA solid state drive to make this thing really fast. But nothing worked. I tried compact flash adapters, nothing worked. I actually had to find an old drive, which thankfully I had lying around, um, in order to install Mac OS and have it see the drive. It's, there's something, this, this generation of iMac specifically, there's something, they're aliens, you know, they're, they're a hodgepodge of parts they had left over that's just, um, <laughs> you know, it's just, <clears throat> what's the word I'm looking for? It's just a, I'm going to do a race and install. There we go. Continue. Installation type. Okay, so this top tip, whenever you install OS X, especially the legacy stuff, uncheck all the, the printer drivers because obviously who's going to have an HP or a Canon printer that's you know, from this time period that still works. And you're gonna wanna uncheck, where is it? The languages, and that is a massive install. It just takes way too much time. I mean, of course, if you're, you know, not in an English speaking country, you're gonna wanna install the language of choice in addition to English probably, just because of, you know, the different types of software applications. Um, most of them are being targeted for the United States, um, but, if you are in the U.S. or an English-speaking country, uncheck that box because it's just it it's just wasted space. You never use it. I mean, if you do need it, just put the installer disk in and then you know install <laughs> install the rest of those languages. There's just no point otherwise. Oh man, come on! All right. Mac OS 3 ain't gonna cut 10.3 ain't gonna cut it. Alright, I don't know if you can see it. You've got uh what is it? A, a grid of uh it's a four by four, so you got sixteen dots, uh just white dots in the center. It's like a image that's not loaded correctly, so that's definitely a crash on this thing. Um I'm gonna try uh ten point one. See what that does. I might literally have to put back that 96 megs of RAM in it if it's not playing nice. Um, this is one of the things, uh, especially for those of you out there who like dealing with um, these old iMacs, um, this is one of the things that you'll find uh, are commonplace, especially on the hodgepodge generation. I'm talking Performas, I'm talking um, PowerPC era Macs in general. So anything that's not 6800 based, Power PC up until uh, 2000, basically when they started having money, you know, from this thing. They used this as a cash cow. Um, iPod, of course, you know, where whatever other revenue they were getting money from. Uh, this, these things are are turds. <laughs> they really are. They want Mac specific drives. They want Mac specific RAM. They're very sensitive to just stuff i mean they just don't like you know using old pc parts and slamming it in there and uh you know that's a real shame you know i mean it's it's not a handsome device it's not a cute device it's just odd looking it's kind of like a um you know it's kind of like driving an old ford pinto you know they're they're not the greatest they catch on fire they're slow but they're kind of neat to look at, you know, especially the ones, uh, you know, pre-73 when they got the bumpers, the little skinny bumper. You know, you don't know what's hiding under there. It could be a, you know, Ford V8 or it could be, a, you know, a Pinto motor. You never know. And to me, that's that's what these things are. They, they are a Pinto. This this is the pinto is Pinto of, of Max. Because <laughs> it's a, a power PC in a interesting case and it yeah it's got problems there's a lot of potential here especially the, the infrared port you know it's got stereo speakers 
you can't hook a iPod to it. Well, you can hook up a later iPod to it, but I mean, as for you know what would have been current uh, in 2000, 2001, you couldn't hook up FireWire to this thing. So it's you know the first first generation, second generation, third generation. Uh, I think even the minis. You wouldn't have been able to sync with this thing, so it wouldn't have been until about two thousand three, two thousand four, um, when you could have hooked an iPod to this thing. And bear in mind, this was released late ninety eight, so you would have had this would have been a five year old or six year old computer by the time you would have been able to install, um, receive, and get a. You know an ipod that would run on this and that's assuming you would have still been rolling with 32 megs you would have still had this beautiful four gig quantum fireball <laughs> you would have you would have been running on this and just imagine ripping your cds and moving them to your ipod oh my god i just oh just shudder at the thought of that that sounds like hell but i mean i know people did it i know i've done it i you know i know people that um, especially at, you know, in high school when, you know, iPods were all the rage, you know, a lot of times the only time to get access to a Mac or a larger library of music, you would have commandeered, you know, an old Power Mac. I mean, the towers, uh, because they would have had the drive space to basically rip off, rip everyone's CDs. The problem is, is that, you know, these things, the first, uh, the, you know, Power Mac G3, G4, um... They only, I think the later G4, Power Mac G4s came with USB 2.0. But I mean, the early stuff, the one that you would have been, well, I would have been dealing with, excuse me. Um, they all had USB 1.1 and moving <laughs> moving music onto an iPod uh, with USB 1.1. Oh my God, just, that's an exercise in patience. I mean, you would literally have to hide your iPod behind the computer, lock it down, and then wait, and then come back at the end of the day, and hopefully all the music would have been moved on. All right, and we're back. Two hours later, and lots and lots of swearing, we're back. So, excuse me. Right now, the Mac is showing, has 288 megabytes of RAM. So the, the solution is, whenever you're dealing with these, these use the, the max use low density um, PC66 SD RAM. Something looks something like this. This is a 64 meg one. I was able to cheese it a little bit by putting a 32 meg in the slot in the slot under the CPU and then putting the PC100 low density RAM, the 256 one on the top slot and it solved the problem. So now, I mean, ideally I would like 512 megs of RAM in this thing, but I just don't think it's going to be cost effective or easy to obtain that type of RAM, you know, here here in 2021. But here it is. It's a iMac, it works, and I've got Class Classilla installed. And there it is. Works great. And uh, yeah, it doesn't go on YouTube though. I gotta find a solution to that. Probably going to be Mac OS X or something something similar. But I mean for you know going on Wikipedia, looking up stuff, works perfectly. Now as I said earlier, uh, long-term goals with this machine are gonna be basically to use it to interface with uh, old Palm Pilots, uh, Apple Newtons, devices of that nature, and using this as like a, uh, uh, I would say a local talk machine to communicate and transfer data between older, um, older Apple, Apple workstations, meaning Macintosh SEs, PowerMac 6100, things of that nature. Um, that I've got lying around the house that I need to basically transfer data into without having to bust out the floppy drive and you know doing all the neat tricks to write uh, 800k discs um, you know that that in today's day and age is very difficult uh, one finding the media and then two <laughs> writing the data in a suitable drive uh, most of the floppy drives nowadays are 1.44 uh, 
um, if you can find them. But yeah, that's that's it. This is this is the Macintosh. Uh, excuse me. This is the iMac G3. It's a Revision A. It's 233 megahertz. It's got uh, 200 and I just saw it. Let me exit Classilla first. And it's got 288 megabytes of RAM. It's got an 80 gig hard drive. Uh, like I said, circa 2004, 2005 uh, IDE hard drive out of, out of an old HP machine. Works perfect. And it connects onto the internet via a Vonitz uh, uh, Ethernet to Wi Fi adapter. Yeah, no, I I hope you like this one. I this thing was absolute pain in the. This thing was absolute pain to deal with. It's the. I would say I'm just glad it's done. Uh, at some point, I'm going to be doing some modifications to it. Um, probably going to put uh, another partition of OS 10 on it. Um, you notice that I have this thing only contains one drive, um, but. You could see I have a second one that's labeled storage and just has, you know, 80 gigs of data all formatted as a Mac OS uh, journaled extent or extended journaled. And then I'll install 10.1 and then 10.2 on another 8 gig partition just, you know, just to see how it performs. Um, to me, this is a transition machine, especially for Apple's. Uh, this is a transition machine between the old and the new. It doesn't have any legacy ports, so you're going to have to use dongles and other adapters and other tricks to, you know, get data into it or out of it. Um, but it's, you know, it's a handy machine, I think. I think it's going to be useful, useful in the long term. Now, for those of you who are actually looking for one of these, don't buy one. This thing was just finding one that works, that's in relatively decent condition, that's not all yellowed out. As you can see, the I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see it on camera. This thing is very, it's just about starting to turn. It's, you know, you can see that this clear right here is not the same as this clear. And when these were new, and if they were kept indoors, the, you know, the plastic color would be a very uniform, this type of clear all the way around. Um, and you could see, maybe I can pop this off here and show you a little better. You can kind of see that beige yellowing starting to turn on this thing. Oh, there it is. You can even see on the inside, it's this. This used to be a very silver color, and it's just starting to yellow. And it's, you know, that's just what's going to happen to all these machines as time goes on. Even even the ones that are kept indoors and, you know, in, in areas that are, I would say, uh, thermally stable and there's no... Climate control. If, if it's in a climate controlled storage in a box, it will yellow over time no matter what. I, the rate is going to be much slower, but it will yellow over time. And, you know, the end result is going to be, you know, disgusting computers. I know that there's retro bright and there's things of that nature that will help improve the look. Um, but with regards to the long term effectiveness of it and does it affect the strength of the plastic? Does it make it brittle? What's you know? What are the long-term consequences? Um, it remains to be seen. It's just you know, it's wait and see. We'll see what happens. Um, <clears throat> for those of you that really want one of these things, make sure that when you get one of these, it comes with the door because I know that these break off and fall off, at like like I've just demonstrated, and. The Revision A keyboards have a power button, whereas the later ones do not. They um, can be something like the Apple Pro keyboard, like this, which arguably is a much better keyboard, but you notice there's no power button. Um, and those ones are for the iMac DV and the later ones with Firewire. Um, they're good machines, it's just that that's something that, you know, if you want a complete set, you want it to be match these ones came with power buttons. I believe the Power Mac G3s also came with the same type of keyboard, uh, but don't hold me on that. I have to, I have to look that up. Um, but there it is. I hope you liked it. I know um, 
I know I unfortunately I'm running out of 3M Cantata material again. You know the, those tapes are as scarce as hen's teeth, and uh, I just you know I just want to keep throwing stuff on the channel and keep you guys interested and and uh, hope you enjoy it. Well, thanks for watching and uh, see you again next time.